I just wanted to clarify, I checked on the Casper website. You're still the CEO of Casper. I am indeed, yep. It hasn't changed at all. Right, so uh, what's what's your focus uh, in mental health been uh, since we last spoke? It might be two, three, four years ago, perhaps. Yeah, I've been out of the country for a while. I went over and spent a couple of years in Europe, um, over in Ireland, and been back in New Zealand for about 18 months. And my focus, well, my focus is always suicide prevention was a, a particular passion for youth suicide prevention so that hasn't changed but what I have been doing over the last couple of years is doing lots of research, upskilling, um, reviewing evidence about uh, what's working and what's not working, networking with people around the globe who are working in this space and um, and doing a, a range of different things and I've also been writing a, a paper on what's going on in New Zealand um, in terms of suicide and uh, what the evidence tells us we need to be doing differently. Well, uh, the the statistics aren't uh, very impressive, are they? We had another increase uh, to 606 uh, in total, total suicides in New Zealand. I think we have the highest youth suicide uh, rates in the um, in the modern world, or the OECD, as they call it. Um, yeah. I, I guess you're not heartened uh, by the trends. No, absolutely not. It's a it's a complete tragedy. And and as a mother who's lost a child to suicide, um, you know those numbers are um, represent the absolute devastation of um, of families and communities. So they're more than than just numbers to me. Um, I'm obviously, you know, really distressed about the increase in numbers, but in no way surprised. And, you know, people who followed the work that we've done in Casper over the years have seen that we have said repeatedly that if we keep doing more of the same, then we are going to keep getting more of the same. And and so this increase in numbers comes as no surprise to us at all. So if you've always done what you've... Well, is it if you all if you always do what you've always done, you'll always get what you've always got. Precisely, and you know, every year the suicide statistics go up, and the response is to do more of the same, and then express some sort of surprise when the following year um, the suicide numbers continue to go up. I mean, it just seems logical that if what what you're doing is um, it's not working, then you look seriously at alternatives. But, you know, there seems to be a, an unwillingness to look outside of the medical model framework and say, hey, we need to do something differently. I guess there's also, uh, outside of the medical model, though, there's the increasing stress of living in New Zealand. I mean, there are so many... Um, indicators uh, in terms of house prices, rents, uh, cost of living, cost of food, uh, the poverty, uh, the children in poverty, all of those things are are indicated, surely. Uh, Oh, absolutely. And it's interesting that, you know, when you look at the OECD statistics, New Zealand is almost always in the top five countries for those very negative indicators. I think what's also really interesting is that there was a a really important piece of research published in New Zealand in 2014. The Canadian historian John Weaver was given access to 100 years' worth of suicide files in New Zealand coroner's files. And he went through around 12,000 cases of suicide and he looked at all the evidence that was presented in inquest, he looked at people's medical records, he looked at school records, statements made by family members... And what he found overwhelmingly was that suicide was directly linked to social, political and cultural factors. It was about poverty. It was about relationship breakdowns. It was about bullying and abuse. Um, It was about all those social indicators that you've just talked about. And he's enormously critical of the medicalisation of suicide and suicide prevention. Now, interestingly, I rang the Ministry of Health recently and said to them, you know, when you were looking at the draft suicide prevention strategy, how much weight did you give to this 
amazing piece of evidence from uh, John Weaver. And they said, who? Never heard of him. Can you give us the title of the book? Um, I find that incredibly disheartening. Yeah, well, I mean, going back to the previous government and you mentioned the suicide prevention uh, plan, The I guess there was a working party of uh, people uh, who were planning, uh, supposedly planning uh, the suicide prevention strategy, although it appears that uh, they were just sort of... To- tokenists really uh, that the plan had already been agreed um, and, yep. and at least one Mike King uh, pulled out because the government wasn't prepared to put a target on it particularly the former Minister of Health Jonathan Coleman uh, wasn't prepared to put a target on it uh, what, what, what's your view around that that objective uh, that people wanted uh, to put a target on uh, our suicide uh, total Well, in relation to the target, I think there is only one appropriate target, and that is zero. I don't think that we can say we're prepared to tolerate a certain number of suicides every year. You know, do we really want to line up 10 children who we know are going to die next year and say, look, as long as we can save two of them, um, you know, we'll pat ourselves on the back and say we're doing okay. We won't worry too much about the other eight. Mm. There is only one appropriate target, and that is zero. Um, But the government absolutely needs to be really clear about what their um, outcome objectives are here. I'm tired of hearing about process. We delivered this many sessions and we gave out this many drugs and we employed this many people and did this many training sessions. So what if people are still dying? So yeah, I'm, I'm absolutely clear that we need to set very ambitious targets and work our butts off to achieve them and not say, you know, oh, some suicides are inevitable, so we'll just shrug our, our shoulders over them. Well, and in relation a... to the whole process around um, the development of the draft strategy, I was fascinated to see that the working group had been given um, a, a set of evidence about what works and what doesn't. Um, but that the person who had been contracted, we were told it was an independent contractor, that person wasn't named. Well, when I did an Official Information Act request, I was not surprised to see that it was Annette Beautre, who in fact is not an independent contractor. She works for the Ministry of Health, but who was also the author of the previous suicide prevention strategy. And that doesn't give you a lot of confidence that the government is saying we want to explore new and different ways of um, of doing this suicide prevention thing. Yeah, well, I guess when you use the term suicide, uh, sorry, uh, a government, uh, you're talking about the previous government. Uh, uh, we are yet to see uh, what the performance of the Labour-led government is going to be in terms of suicide prevention. But in reading that uh, draft suicide prevention plan, I mean, I was just stunned at the innocuous language, the mamby-pamby sort of, oh, we'll do this by... Uh, tongue at a fan or or something um i mean there just didn't seem to be anything that you could get your teeth into absolutely not and <coughs> excuse me um <coughs> you know you, you kind of uh, like i say i've just been overseas for two years and when people heard that um our expert advisory group on suicide prevention included a sporting star and a comedian um they wondered why we were not calling in expertise that exists around the world um, and that has been offered to the government. So you know, there was certainly some raised eyebrows overseas at what New Zealand was doing. But what I didn't what see about anything your... in the... Sorry. So, sorry to interrupt there, but what about your own expertise? I mean, you've been CEO of CASPA, which is the Community Action on Suicide Prevention, Education and Research. I mean, uh, what's your relationship uh, with, uh, if you like, or, uh, government authorities? Um, I have a relationship with people at the Ministry of Health but um, I don't know if you remember the New Zealand Herald doing a series of Official Information Act requests where they asked um, for anything that the government had said about CASPA and, um, and they got all the emails back where we had been discussed 
And the New Zealand Herald summed that up by saying that the government said that we were dangerous and influential um, and that they had never um, tested any of the um, strategies that we put in place or any of the suggestions that we were making. They were just concerned that we were challenging the medical model and that that might stop people from engaging with mental health services. So, yeah, I, I don't get a sense that there's any respect at all for... Um, the work that we've done or the views that we hold or any of the research that that's based on. Um, so I'm certainly not surprised to not be invited to a government advisory group. Uh, but just taking you back to, uh, it sounds as though you've been doing some of your own research into suicide, uh, not only yeah. locally but internationally. What, what are some of your findings and thoughts um, well, in relation to the international stuff, I've become really interested in the whole issue of social prescribing. And that's quite big over in, in Europe where people are moving away from the prescribing of medications um, to prescribing other interventions that have a good evidence base. CASPA's expanded on that hugely. So rather than um, social prescribing from our perspective being just maybe... Um, you know, going to the gym or, or whatever instead of getting a, a bottle of pills. We've reviewed the evidence for all sorts of interventions from um, art therapy and play therapy um, to contact with animals and green spaces and things and reviewed the evidence base for those and put together a social prescribing program um, that we think reflects the evidence of what works and is a good alternative to... Um, you know, just diagnosis and medication. In so, relation to New Zealand, I spent six months doing a series of Official Information Act requests um, because I wanted to get the data about what was really happening in New Zealand, not what we were told was happening by the Mental Health Foundation and the government. And using the data that I was provided by government officials, um, set out a, a paper looking at what is actually happening in New Zealand. I mean, for example, um, most people in New Zealand would have heard from government officials and the Mental Health Foundation that 90% of people who kill themselves have a mental illness. When you request the diagnosis data on those people who have died from the New Zealand government, you find out that, in fact, 40% had no diagnosis whatsoever despite having been assessed. And only 32% had a diagnosis of depression. So I wanted to get behind the spin and the, the sales talk and find out what was really going on for people. And as a result of that, was able to develop a, um, a paper which presents 17 recommendations on what CASPA believes um, needs to happen in order for the suicide rates to start trending down. Uh, I'd, I'd like to just take you back to that figure of 90%. I mean, is the government and the Mental Health Foundation actually uh, trumpeting uh, that 90% of those people who commit suicide have a, a mental health diagnosis? I mean, I think you'd only have to go to the annual report uh, of mental health uh, done by John Crawshaw to see that uh, it's well below 90%. Yes, they absolutely say that. So the government says that. They say that 90% of people who kill themselves have a mental illness. And when I got this data on the actual diagnosis, I rang the Ministry of Health and said, do you still stand by those statements? And they refused to answer the question. The Director of Mental Health used to, well, in fact, in 2007 was the last time that he published diagnosis data for those people who died by suicide under the care of mental health services. And when I asked why that data is no longer published, they said, well, it shows that 40% of people had no mental health issues at all. And we just don't believe that that could be true, so we don't publish it. Mm. I mean, one of the things (laughs) I've challenged uh, John Crawshaw, the director of mental health, about why uh, those people over 65 who commit suicide are not included in the statistics. Um, The the actual numbers of those uh, who commit suicide over 65 are 
detailed in his last report, in his last annual report. He puts a figure of 58 on them. So um, if we add uh, the total from last year of 606 and add 58, we're getting closer to uh, 700. Um, yes, and then let's you know look at the fact that the World Health Organization says that developed nations like New Zealand probably undercount by about thirty percent. Um, we're getting up into some really big numbers. Yeah, and then I guess you could, if you're a, um, a cynic like me, you could say, well, what about uh, those? Those some deaths on the road, uh, which c- probably can never be proved to be suicide, but what causes somebody to just drive across the median line and hit a truck? Exactly, when there's no evidence of braking. Many drownings um, are very difficult to categorise whether they were accidental or suicide. And, and then we have the older people who just stop eating and stop caring for themselves right. and um, you know their deaths are hardly ever counted as suicide either yeah. but uh, I, I think we can be pretty confident that the numbers are far higher than um, the reported numbers. Yeah, I've got uh, Declan Curran here, who you may have met uh, in previous years. Uh, he's our technician and production man. Just wanted to yep. make a comment. Yeah, I've spoken to you on the phone before, uh, Maria, probably yeah. under a different name then. Um, it, it actually, the, the analogy of um, you know the driving across the road in a truck is interesting to say that because I knew um, a young guy who that situation had occurred, but he had difficulties with staying awake behind the wheel. And right. uh, when I spoke to the um, investigating uh, police officer, he said, well, we're putting it down as a suicide because of the nature of it. So it seems to me like it's very easy for them to find another reason when it could very clearly be, um, you know, something, it could be something else, but they, they will pin suicide onto it um, rather than actually look deeper. Look, and I think what you're highlighting is the fact that because we don't conduct proper causality assessments in New Zealand, there are all sorts of factors that come to play um, which impact on verdicts and decisions. And those are about people's own beliefs. They're about what they believe the family wants as a finding, um, some kind of message that they want to send. Um, and that's why the numbers are so precarious, because they, you know, they're really based on very little in the way of hard evidence, more on opinions and, and people exercising discretion. You mentioned uh, zero suicide, and we've uh, <coughs> we've interviewed Sean Lines uh, from the Hawke's Bay, uh, who seems to be a, a non mental health person who's who's pushing this issue of zero suicide. Um, yep. I mean, it's it's certainly been of great interest to me, but but it does seem to me that the ambition or the goal of zero suicide in a country where we've got increasing suicides, I mean, what are we going to do to turn that around and even get a reduction, let alone zero? Well, what we're going to do is stop saying that suicide will be prevented in mental health clinics and GP clinics and you know, in the beehive, and return to a model where suicide is presented, prevented by families and communities who are well-resourced, who are well-educated and well-supported. Because it's going to be very difficult to get everybody who's distressed or socially isolated or suffering from trauma in front of a GP or, or a mental health professional. But it's not difficult to engage a community in looking out for each other and supporting each other. And in my view, that's the way we have to go um, in order to get the numbers down. I mean, I gather you're living in Wellington now. I mean, is... No. No? Where did you get that from? I'm living in Tokoroa. Oh, you're living in Tokoroa. (laughs) Well, that's yeah. probably that's probably why you can talk authoritatively about community, maybe because uh, community it could be alive and well in in small town New Zealand. But you know, I'm again being a bit sceptical. It's often difficult to capture community in the big city. Of course, it's difficult, and you know, intractable social issues like this are always difficult. But building community cohesion um, is something that's absolutely doable and within you know when we talk about community we're not necessarily talking about physical communities the people who live 
around you, your neighbours. We could be talking about virtual communities, online communities. We can be talking about communities of, of interest or um, shared ethnicity or sexual orientation or whatever. There's lots of ways to do community mm. and, and to build cohesion and, and support around. You're with Take It From Us on 104.6 Planet FM. You, uh, you're organising in the early early in the new year a, a, a seminar series. You call it seminars, do you? Uh, yeah, we've said a lecture tour, but yep, similar. A lecture tour, a crisis in mental health. Um, I mean, there's a lot of talk about crisis in mental health. Uh, the Herald uh, that you mentioned earlier uh, had a, a major series called Break the Silence, uh, which I guess um, was very much about uh, suicide, youth suicide, but, uh, you know, really underlined and reinforced the sort of crisis in our own mental health system. Um, your your goals and your objectives with this lecture tour is uh, can you explain those to us? Yeah, sure. Well, look, the lecture tour arose because when I did that series of official information act requests to the government, I asked them what their response was to research by eminent professor Peter Gercher, uh, published in the British Medical Journal in 2016, showing that antidepressants double the risk not only of suicide but of violence, particularly in young people. And whether that meant that the government was going to change its policy on having medication as baseline treatment and blah, blah, blah. And the government's response was Peter Who. Um, we don't know anything about Peter Gurcher. And doubling the risk of suicide from these drugs is not news to us. We've known that for ages. So I got in touch with Peter and said, hey, did you know that the New Zealand government has never heard of you? They don't know about the important work that you've done in this space. I think you need to come over here and meet with um, our politicians and talk to our communities. And he said, well, actually, I'm going to Australia, um, so why don't I add to New Zealand on... Um, and Bob Whitaker jumped on board, and we've had a number of people since then. Um, so I asked Bob Whitaker to put something together for me the other day about the purpose of this, and I think he puts it really well. He says that what we want to do is present a review of the scientific findings that reveal why the adoption of the disease model, you know, the, the labelling of people as mentally ill, and the resulting increase in the diagnosis of psychiatric disorders and prescribing of psychiatric drugs inevitably leads to worsening mental health for a society. Um, and to explore alternatives to drug treatments. So that's quite a big handle, isn't it? Uh, but but I guess a key plank of that is the danger of psychiatric uh, medications. Um, yeah, so absolutely. I mean, you know, our, our keynote speaker, Professor Gurcher, has um, done a huge amount of research. He is a um, professor in clinical research design and analysis at the University of Copenhagen. He established the um, Nordic Cochrane Centre and, and is on the board of Cochrane internationally. And for those people who don't know the um, Cochrane Centres, they are centres of research excellence, widely held to be the gold standard of, of evidence um, around medical issues. And so he has researched these drugs extensively and he believes absolutely that they do far more harm than good, that we either need to constrain enormously our use of them or not use them at all. Um, so Professor Gurcher will, will present the global evidence around that. We've also got um, Robert Whitaker, who is a, a science journalist who has written numerous books and received numerous prizes. Um, his key focus is on the worse long-term outcomes for people on drugs um, than for people who are not medicated. But we've also pulled in people from other disciplines. We have um, senior lecturer in sociology from Auckland University, Bruce Cohen, who's going to come and talk to us from a sociological perspective about the harms of the mental health system and about the evidence that what we call psychiatric illness is actually um, the development of coping strategies for dealing with trauma and social issues. We have Professor Roger Mulder, who's a New Zealand psychiatrist from the University of Otago, 
um, who's going to present some research that he's done recently. Uh, specifically, he's looked at the fact that we've increased our funding for mental health services from $1.1 billion back when my son died nine years ago um, to nearly $4 billion now. That uh, the number of psychiatrists and psychologists in this country has doubled. Uh, that's 13.7% of all New Zealanders have been prescribed antidepressants and 3.1 antipsychotics. And yet, with all this treatment, which you would expect would improve outcomes, our outcomes worsen year upon year. Um, so he's going to be having a look at that evidence. And we also have Melissa Raven from Australia, who's actually a Kiwi pretending to be an Australian. And she's a psychiatric epidemiologist, a clinical psychologist and a policy analyst. And she's going to be talking about how what is presented to us as evidence around um, treatments in, in mental health is completely misrepresented and, um, and is used to develop bad policy that results in harms to people. So we've got a really wide range of um, experts speaking and then we have some people with lived experience and I'm excited to announce that David Carmichael is going to come over from Canada and speak in the lecture tour. For those who don't know David, um, David is a Canadian father who shortly after being prescribed antidepressants took the life of his 11 year old son and um, has significant body of evidence that it was the his use of antidepressants that caused his um, his killing of his child. So David's going to come and talk to us about that. He's been interviewed for the BBC Panorama program um, when they were looking at the James Holmes um, Batman shooter murders, and he's a really compelling speaker. To sneak something in there, that's that's actually quite important. That because. Um, the money that's to be made out of pharmaceuticals, um, they, they push everything they possibly can because of what's in it for them, and it's a vicious Absolutely. cycle. Absolutely. Mm. Yeah, and, you know, we've seen that. We've seen GSK find $3 billion for illegally marketing drugs to children. Now, in New Zealand, they don't even need to bother to do that. Um, they've never applied for approval for antidepressants for children in New Zealand because they know that by offering incentives to GPs, um, they can just do it without even seeking approval. You know, for somebody like me whose child was under the age of 18 and died on an antidepressant, to, to learn after that that these drugs have never been approved by the New Zealand government for children under 18, on the grounds, according to MedSafe, that the suicide risk outweighs any benefits and yet to know that the pharmaceutical companies are promoting them for children as young as one year old um yeah, yeah could, could you just clarify this because i've always understood that uh, it was illegal to prescribe drugs to people under the age of 18 but um that's clearly no not, not at all um, the government's been promising to review our Medicines Act, which dates back to 1981, um, but the, that seems to have been put on hold indefinitely. Section 25 of the Medicines Act says um, that any doctor can prescribe any drug to any person, uh, whether it's approved by the government or not, whether it's potentially fatal or not. Doctors are allowed to do that with impunity. It's, it's called off-label prescribing. And um, I mean, last figures I saw, which were a bit out of date, show around 15,000 children under the age of 18 on these drugs. So it's certainly not illegal. Yeah, well, they, I think the Herald uh, 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 promoted that story, and uh, the numbers were horrifying. I, I, th I think it was a bit 13,000 or 15,000 or something like yeah. that. Uh, and these people. include children in the zero to four age group. You know, these are. Uh, we have no idea what the long-term effects of these drugs are on children. Mm. But the fact that they have never been through a government approval process to determine whether they are safe and effective but can be handed out to kids like lollies is really scary, especially when we look at Peter Birch's research showing that they double the risk of suicide in young people. Anybody's 